Hi, I'm Matt Montgomery. I'm part of the agronomic team here in the central and west central part of the state of Illinois for Pioneer. I just pulled into home and before I went downstairs and started working in the office on some other things, I wanted to take just a little bit of time to film a segment on plant parasitic nematodes. We did a survey within Pioneer about a year ago. Our reps went out and pulled soil samples from fields, tried to trim off a little bit of corn root tissue as they did that sent those into the lab and in the process we all became just a little bit surprised at what those results were. We saw some corn nematode species that maybe we hadn't expected in certain fields. I think the big thing that jumped out to many of us was the fact that there were a lot of nematode species, corn nematode species, that showed elevated counts, counts that none of us probably had expected or didn't expect to find in that many different locations. You know, corn nematodes are something worth us keeping our eye on. Soybean cyst nematode is something worth us keeping our eye on always. Down in the southern part of the state, root knot nematode can also be an issue. Those are very real problems that cause very real yield losses. The problem is, though, that because we can't spot those usually without the aid of a microscope, they seem just a little bit less real. They're causing real yield loss, but because we can't see them, they don't seem like a real problem. And part of what I wanted to do today was try and make them feel just a little bit more real to you. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how they feed. We're gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about what nematodes actually are. And then we're gonna kind of briefly go through nematode anatomy. And hopefully by the end, this pest feels just a little bit more real to you. The number one thing that we probably should get down as we go through this is that nematodes are very small. P corn nematodes, plant parasitic nematodes are rather small in size. A lot of the species that we encounter are not much longer than the period at an end of the sentence. Um, if you look at some of the longer uh, nematode species, if you strung a few periods together, maybe came up with something on the order of the size of a dash, they're maybe just a little bit shorter than that. We're talking about really, really tiny animals, members of the animal kingdom. They really don't get a lot of size to them. And so oftentimes we have to use a microscope to actually observe them. We're gonna pull soil samples usually for this. We're gonna try to shave off root material. We're gonna do that early in the growing season before they migrate down in the soil profile. We're gonna send those into a lab. That lab is gonna process those samples and then they're actually gonna do counts. They're gonna identify species and do counts on them in that sample that's been processed. The other thing worth keeping in mind about nematodes is they're kind of different than some of the other animals you and I are used to. Even though they look kind of like earthworms because they have that worm-like structure to their body, they're actually very, very different. You know, an earthworm has organs and those organs within its body cavity are stitched together with tissues. You and I have a body cavity, right? And the organs within us are kind of stitched together with tissues. A nematode's not like that. A nematode is basically a bag of water with organs floating around loosely within it. And because of that, if a nematode's skin is pierced, it will literally deflate and die in that instant. You and I get a piercing, uh, something that kind of pierces through our skin, and we don't think about that being life-threatening. Maybe infection can start. Maybe if it's really bad, it's life-threatening. But we usually don't die immediately from some kind of penetration of the skin. Nematodes do. If that cuticle is cut, they deflate, they die immediately. Now let's talk just a little bit more about how these organisms feed. If we look at plant parasitic nematodes, they're a little bit different, again, than some of the other things we're used to. They do have a mouth, but that mouth doesn't open and close with the plant parasitic version of nematode. Instead, all plant parasitic nematodes have a needle-like mouth part called a stylet. And that stylet comes out through that little opening called the mouth. It is actually what penetrates the root and actually enters plant cells and begins to suck juices out. That's the way that nematodes feed. They feed through the action of suction, drawing in cytoplasm from the cell into the stylet and then traveling that down their esophagus. Nematodes do occasionally have things called lips, structures on the front that when suction is applied can allow that nematode to kind of firmly attach plunger to that root system, really firmly attached to it. And again, that's all because of the suction action that occurs. 
Now, nematodes get that suction action by kind of increasing and decreasing the size of their esophagus. There are little muscles that surround that little esophageal tract. And if they contract, they open up that esophagus really wide, that creates suction and is used to then pull food in. And a nematode is a little bit, the plant parasitic nematodes are a little bit like flies in the fact that they regurgitate into their food source. There's a little gland, a little area that we call the DEG, the opening is called the DEGO, and there are digestive enzymes that are squirted out of that through the stylet into that host plant cell, and they either begin to slowly digest those cellular contents or they manipulate the cell. They result in the cell changing so that it becomes a better food source. So the suction action actually occurs because of that esophageal tract getting wider. They kind of regurgitate into there. And some plant parasitic nematodes have a little swollen area in that esophageal tract called the median bulb. Now, after that material, after that nutrition passes through the front part of the nematode, it gets to the very back end and it goes through a little one-way valve that's called a cardia so that we don't have any back siphoning of the stuff going into the intestine coming back up into the front part of the nematode. It goes down into the intestine. That nutrition is absorbed from that area. And then of course, waste material is excreted through something called the anal pore. And there are actually several different openings, a few different openings that you might see on plant parasitic nematodes. And all of those openings are on the, what we call the underside the ventral side of the nematode. And a nematologist has to kind of know those structures and the fact that they represent the ventral side so that they can actually ID species. And they have to know some of the parts of the nematode that we're gonna discuss just a little bit more so that they can identify species as well. They notice the size of certain organs. They notice how they overlap one another. All those things are used to identify nematode species. Now, how does a nematode find its food source in the soil when there's no light, nothing for it to actually be able to visually catch a sense of where the root is. There are little sensory organs on the head and the tail that act like heat seeking missiles for that nematode. They actually detect gases and root exudates being released and that allows the nematode to figure out in the soil profile where that root is and hone in on it. And incidentally, one of the ways that we knock out certain corn nematode species with certain plants, for instance, like mustards, brassicas, is that we knock out those sensory structures. And that leaves the nematode blind. It wanders aimlessly. It can't find the root and it starves to death. That's how some nematicide-like products work. Another way that nematicide-like products work is that they directly impact the nervous system. And a nematode actually does have a nervous system. They have a very crude brain called a nerve ring, and they have a nerve cord that runs down the top and on the underside of that nematode's body that help control movement, feeding, all those kind of other things. And with certain nematicides, especially those that were more popular maybe a decade plus back, we actually target that part of the nematode, that neurological function within the nematode and that's what knocks that thing out. There's also a muscular system that helps the nematode move around. We talked about the cuticle, the skin. There's this little nerve, I should say, uh, this little muscular ring that runs around the nematode. And while there's no bones inside that nematode, that little bag of water uses water pressure to act like a hydroskeleton and the muscles move against that. So again, we're talking about microscopic sized bags of water that suck juices from the plant that actually regurgitate into their food source that do have a very crude nervous system that do have a very crude muscular system that are very different even though they look like worms to the organisms that you and I are familiar with and they can cause significant injury. Well, we hope that makes nematodes feel just a little bit more real to you and we hope that you'll watch out for those, keep your eye on that pest, and try to manage it better on your own farm. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll talk with you soon. That concludes this Pioneer Agronomy video podcast. Visit our page on pioneer.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more agronomy insights.